Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'd like to introduce uh, Stefan, who is going to talk about high performance science today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, <laughs> so who am I? Um, so yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you uh, to the organizers of the Linux conference for uh, having me as a speaker. It's a, a great pleasure and honor. Um, my name is Stefan Bollmann. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the um, Center for Advanced Imaging in Brisbane at the University of Queensland. And I'm also part of the National Imaging Facility, which is an Australia-wide network of um, people doing imaging and uh, looking after image equipment and making sure that scientists can get the best use out of this equipment. In my work, I aim to develop new ways of imaging the human brain to detect diseases as early as possible. And today I want to talk about the data analysis workflows in neuroimaging. And I want to highlight problems we come across in these complex workflows and how we solved some of them using open source software. So you now might wonder, what is the implication of this complexity we deal with in, uh, in research and in these image processing pipelines? And what can possibly go wrong? Well, first, scientists write a lot of software, but we are not trained in software development. Or most of us are not trained. And there will be bugs. The problem is for us that um, bugs are quite uh, difficult to find because it's not that our applications crash. Uh, the worst thing for us is that uh, they produce uh, results that are possibly plausible but wrong. And this is a nice uh, comic illustrating that. So it's called selective debugging. And the student comes to the professor and says, well, how do I know I didn't make a mistake in my computer code, Professor Smith? Well, did you double check it? Yes. Triple checked it? Yes. Quadruple checked it? Yes. Did it conform our hypothesis? Yes. Well, then stop checking it. <laughs> and, and that is a problem. So when, when we write code, we only look for problems if the result doesn't make sense. If it makes sense, we go on and do the next step. And that is quite dangerous. And I will come back to this later. Um, and some answers for that will be unit testing, continuous integration, and how we can get this into science. Um, but, yeah. So one, we also deal with large amounts of data. That's another problem. And it makes it quite difficult because often we have to run on different hardware platforms to process this data. So I will come to this also back later. But we, we acquire data on one machine which, which runs on uh, on a Linux uh, uh, cluster in the instrument, which we don't even have access to. And then we, we process this maybe on a Windows machine, and we move it to another HPC cluster. Um, we move it to the cloud, and we, we process on lots of different infrastructures, which makes it quite difficult um, to, yeah, to handle the data and also to, to ensure that what we have done um, is correct. Um, and yeah, as I already said, um, we run on different hardware and operating systems. And one example of this is um, this paper looked at the reproducibility of neuroimaging analyses across operating systems. And I found something quite surprising. Um, they only varied one little library in their version, which was glibc from 2.5 to 2.18, which was just a couple of years between these, two, uh, these library versions. And they found that um, the floating point precision uh, changed in, in, in simple underlying functions. Now you would say, well, this doesn't really matter. It's the seventh digit or something like that. Who cares? Well, the problem is we run very long pipelines and our errors we do, they accumulate. And this is an example. So this is a brain and um, we do the statistical tests on them. So we would like to find out, is it a certain patient different from a control. So we run a statistical test on it. And here you see a statistical test running, comparing the results of the same person once processed, compiled against glibc 2.5 and once against compiled 2.18. And there's a statistical significant difference. And 
this is not good because if you think about you, you run parts of your subject on one machine and have another part of your subject on a different machine, you get lots of variability just because of the different underlying software. So there's a very, you basically decrease your statistical power because now you added computational noise to the already underlying difficult problem. And all of these problems together, they make it quite difficult for us to share our data and reproduce our analyses. Sometimes even our own analyses are difficult to reproduce six months down the line because some library updated and we depend on lots of external software and we simply can't run our own analysis anymore. And when we give it to a colleague, they often can't as well, which, is, um, which leads to lots of uh, implications. And um, I just cropped uh, three articles here where some people say, well, mo why most published research findings are false? Um, cluster failure, why fMRI inference for spatial extent have inflated false positive rates? Um, and also studies looking at the reproducibility of, of the studies we, we do. So in addition to these technical issues, there are incentives in science to produce surprising results. And it has been shown in recent years that a lot of the literature contains positive bias or bias towards positive outcomes and results. So today I only want to focus on the technical aspects of this problem and what we can do with open source software to help us doing better science. So I will not focus on the incentives and there's, there's a lot more wrong, not just uh, our software approach to that. So um, let's start our data journey. Um, with a participant entering in the scanner, so usually they are put on a bed, so this is an MRI scanner. Very often in, uh, in articles when they talk about MRI scanners, they actually show a, show a CT scanner. Um, in this case, this is an MRI. Um, it produces a very strong magnetic field, which aligns our molecules in the body, and then we manipulate this with radio frequency waves, and we create an image. And uh, the radiographers, um, place the subjects in a head coil so they get this little helmet on top and this is uh, our receive and uh, sometimes also transmit system where we transmit radio waves into the body and we also receive them. So that's where the journey starts. It's a uh, fully commercial system. Um, for example, this machine is uh, produced by Siemens and it's uh, called a Magnetum Prisma. Um, as a first step, this machine encodes the image in, we call that case space. Uh, but it's basically a Fourier representation of the signal. So the first step we have to do is we have to apply an inverse Fourier transform to get an image back. And we call that, plus some or plus a lot of other corrections, we call that image reconstruction. And this is where I would like to start in this pipeline. So I will, today I want to talk you, or I will take you through this whole pipeline and show where we can use open source software to get better results. Um, so since the beginning of MRI, um, we have the problem that our raw data format is vendor specific. So depending on if you, if you buy a Siemens or a GE scanner or a Philips scanner, they will save their data in their own format and they will often not even tell you how they did it, which makes it quite difficult to share the data and, and work with it. So one solution came up recently where an open source format based on HDF5 um, was designed and was developed together with routines for converting from every closed source vendor format to this open format. And this also helps us in the next step because also reconstructing this raw data is highly vendor specific. Um, but we would like to play with these reconstructions and actually improve them and, and do science with them. So there is a group around Michael Hansen and he developed an open source image reconstruction system that allows us um, to implement our own reconstruction algorithms and it bypasses the closed, send, uh, the closed source vendor pipeline. Um, so they are, they are used in, in clinical applications and they, they have their use and they're really nice, but for research they are very, very difficult to manipulate. So what we do is we take our raw data off the scanner and we are very lucky to be supported by our vendor to do that. So they actually uh, put an, a special network card into their reconstruction system where we can directly pipe off the data, uh, get it to a separate machine, do our reconstruction, 
and then they give us an endpoint where we can push back data. So for the user on the system, it seems that we use the normal vendor reconstruction pipeline, but actually we did all our own thing, um, which is quite cool that we, that we got at this stage. Um, so now the output of this reconstruction pipeline is an image. And these images are usually stored in a format that's called DICOM. And one problem with DICOM is that it uses many small files, which is tricky for some file and archive systems, as you probably know. And I can give one little example from my work. So the problem is DICOM was designed when we had CT scanners, X-rays, so there was just, okay, a couple of hundred images, it's not bad. Today with MRI and with these modern machines we have for example, I can acquire a nine echo data set with 210 slices, 32 channels, and that gives me about 60,000 files for an eight minute scan. And when I put that on our uh, image system, on our storage system, then IT tells me, well, you only have 120,000 IO nodes or I know so they limit me in terms of what I can actually do there. So that's quite tricky. And therefore colleagues of mine at the National Imaging Facility have developed a system that handles this tricky part of um, handling these small DICOM files and curate them. Um, so it's a platform that stores, uh, stores DICOM images in, in archives and we also convert them to more usable data formats for us. Um, and in addition to that, um, we're working on the trusted data repositories where we save um, quality control and quality assurance data together with the data. So in case something goes wrong and a clinician or an, a clinician or a customer says, oh, our images look crap, then we can go back to the calibration data of that week or that day and can say, oh yeah, there was actually a technical problem with the machine um, and we can, we can hopefully fix it. Um, so now we have our data in a format where we can actually start doing analyses on. So we've already come a long way and that's usually where, where talks start when they talk about image processing. Um, so now we need to think about storing this data and, uh, and actually pro processing it. And this is already what I tried to say in the beginning. We process on many different platforms. So we try to look at the data on our own notebooks. Uh, we have special imaging workstations running uh, sometimes Windows, sometimes Linux, depending on what software we need. Because of course these software packages are all not cross-platform. Um, we run on HPC systems. Uh, which often run very old versions of Linux, which is a pain if you want to get new libraries running on there, new software packages, because you can't compile them. Um, and we run on cloud infrastructure. Um, and yeah, so how, how, can, we, how can we get there? Um, for this purpose, the University of Queensland has recently developed a high-performance distributed file system that is supposed to hold all our research data of the whole University of Queensland. And the great feature about the system is that it provides seamless access to data, regardless of where they are created and where we process them. Um, so the data is basically everywhere and it always gets, or it, it is in a central location where it also gets uh, archived for long term and then whenever you process it on, for example, an HPC system, the data will be automatically mirrored there into that HPC system. We can process on it um, and then it will be mirrored back to the central location. So for the researcher handling this data, this process is completely invisible and uh, it works quite well. It took a while to get it up and running but I was a beta tester of that system and um, it's quite nice to, to work with this. So now we have our data on this data fabric and now we need to solve the next problem. How can we, and the problem is, how can we track what happened to our files? So often, this is what I, I'm trying different things when I, do, when I try to create, for example, um, a certain image contrast. So here I show a simple example where I have to create a brain mask and you already see there are lots of manual parameters I have to play with in order to get an acceptable results because it depends on the image sequence we use, it depends on the subject we used. Um, and yes, often yeah, uh, writing a script would be one thing, but yes, sometimes you want to play, that, play with that interactively. And currently there is no easy way of keeping track of what happened to our files. And this is called data provenance or data lineage. Um, there's one file format that we use in our community which can do that already. It's called MINK and 
um, there's one problem with that data format is um, it, it is quite tricky to use um, and it doesn't work, it doesn't play well together with other toolkits we use. Um, so that's why not everyone uses this data format. Um, but yeah, here's a little example how, how the data provenance looks like. So we can always call mink history on a file. And here's one example where this data set was first touched in 2002. There was one command running on it, then this file was given to someone else. And then this command was run on it a year later. Um, so it doesn't, the, the file changed uh, file system, institution, whatever, uh, and we don't even need the script, what, what we had done, but the file reflects what, what had been done to it. So someone else can go and recreate it uh, or can play with the parameters. So this is really powerful. So I wondered, how can we do this uh, with, with arbitrary files, which, which don't support data provenance internally? Um, so many scientists use Git to um, track uh, their source code. Um, so I wondered why can't we not just use Git to keep track of our big files? So uh, our files can be easily uh, in a terabyte range. So that, that makes things not always easier. Um, so I found this extension which is called uh, Git Annex. But if you've, if you've worked with Git Annex, it is quite tricky to handle, let's say, a couple of hundred repositories in a folder, in sub-repositories, because you need to update everything manual. So you find yourself writing scripts to to update everything. Um, so luckily there is a very nice open source project which is called DataLed. And in DataLed, they wrote a wrapper around Git Annex which handles all of these things. So it handles sub-repos, it, it handles multiple uh, storage locations and um, you can, with one command, you can just get a big fMRI data set from the web. Um, they download it from Amazon S3 or wherever these files are and you get it on your machine, you can play with it and then you can push it back out theoretically. And the cool thing is DataLed is not neuroimaging specific. It could be used for any files. If you have video files, if you have music files, it works for anything uh, and keeps track of different locations. Um, so for example, one, one interesting example where, where I use it is I have a central um, data archive on, on this data fabric I said, but this data fabric is sometimes not, of course, not the fastest. So it's, it's nicer to have a, a local copy on an HPC, for example, solid disk state uh, drives. And then I can just check out a copy to this local solid disk, um, do my processing, and then push back these files to the central system. And then with this, I don't lose any history information, and I can always keep track of that. So that is quite nice. And the question that often comes up is, uh, how can I organize my data so that scripts can run efficiently on it? Because often I found myself rewriting the same scripts by just yeah, by saying, okay, where is certain files I need for what I want to do? So a group around researchers around um, Chris Gorgolevsky and Ross Poldrack from Stanford, they thought about an easy way of organizing their data that helps in the first place sharing data because if everyone uses the same data structure, um, that helps. And also to, to help with data pipelines because if everyone uses the same data structure, I can just take my pipeline, give it to someone else and they can hopefully run it on their data without changing the scripts and saying where files are and introduce new mistakes. Um, so that's a simple folder structure instead of having uh, very cryptic naming and um, weird number DICOM folders. So that's what we get from our scanner. Um, they have some scripts which have some heuristics. So they actually look in the header of these files um, and they figure out what sequence is that. And then they can put it um, in the correct folder. So for example, uh, we call that my data set and have, they have a participants uh, overview file uh, and then subject directories, uh, which are numbered. So we can easily access this with scripts. And then we put certain files, for example, an anatomy file, a functional file, or a diffusion weighted imaging um, image. So these are all different images which we need for our processing. They put them in, in fixed name directories. And also the cool thing is if something, if I would take that file out of that file structure, I would still know it's subject 01 and it's T1 weighted image. So I, I'm not just relying on the folder structure, which is great. So that. Um, yeah, that's what, what not all standards do in this field. So that's, that's quite nice and it works very well and got a huge adoption in, in our field. Okay, so we 
already came a long way and now we can finally start extracting the information we actually want from our data. So the following slides are about ways of using different analysis packages in a reproducible way and if possible platform independent. So let's see how far we get on this wish list. Um, the first project I want to highlight is NeuroDebian. This makes our life so much easier. NeuroDebian builds and curates software packages needed for neuroimaging data analysis. And they, a cool thing they do is also they backport newer software to older versions of Debian, um, which is fantastic because often, as I already said, our operating systems are sometimes quite old and we can't easily update them because we have lots of dependencies and we don't want to uh, ruin an analysis um, by, by updating. Um, and they also offer a virtual machine for Windows and Mac users, which makes it quite accessible. They also provide an archive of older software um, in case one needs to reproduce an analysis that the person has done two years ago. So you can actually access an archive and can say, oh, I would like to have this old software version uh, back and installed. And there are also other pure blends of Debian, which you might have heard, like uh, Debian Astro, DBChem, Debian Med, Debian Science, that take care of packages for scientific um, data analysis. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we have analysis software and we can start combining different software packages in, in a, a so-called pipeline. So a pipeline allows the definition of computational steps and a pipeline system ideally checks dependencies and also handles parallelization. And one can either use a scripting language and implement all of these uh, yourself. So I did this in the beginning and then I very quickly realized that I actually have to maintain all that. Um, and then what, what happens quite often for us is uh, I run on one HPC system and then they decide they change the scheduler for that HPC system. So I need to go in all my scripts and need to change the submission commands or I need to write an abstraction layer for the grid systems I use. Um, so this is quite annoying and takes a lot of time and again, more, more room for errors. So ideally what we want is we want to represent an, an analysis as a directed acyclic uh, graph, as you can see here. Um, and luckily there are more than 100 pipeline systems available. So if you look at um, this nice collection, awesome pipeline, um, there's basically every, every scientific field has their own pipeline system because you need a, you need a almost domain specific language to describe that and to have your tools coupled into these systems. Um, so some, um, some famous one, well, Kepler and Galaxy uh, for uh, genomics uh, and C-Brain, OpenMOL, Loney pipeline for imaging. Um, and today I want to show two examples of that. So one example um, is well known for handling uh, software dependencies. And a group of researchers used actually MAKE to perform neuroimaging analysis, which is really cool and, uh, and clever. So this is a typical command line I run. Um, so basically I have an input image which I call T1. This is this image over here. And you see it has a skull around it and often we need to get rid of this skull to do more processing with it. Um, so our output should be T1 brain NIIGZ and the tool which is doing this is called BAT brain extraction tool. Um, and then we can define this as source and target and then I can play with these parameters and then I can, if the output file exists, make will not rerun this command. Um, and if I change the dependencies, it will rerun these commands, which is really handy. The problem with this is, or the problem I had with this is that make files can get quite unreadable, especially when you use all the shortcuts with dollar at and dollar in and out. So I gave my, shell, my make files to someone else and I said, well, I don't know what you've done. And then I looked at it three months later and I had forgotten what I had done. Um, so I thought, okay, we, I should cha change to something that's, that's a bit better um, or that, that helps me in, in writing more readable code. And although it looks like more code, um, I can still read that after three months and I give that to someone else and they can also read it. So this is, this is good. And um, again, this comes from the same guys um, who developed uh, the bits format or who are pushing this, this bits data format. And um, the cool thing is this NiPipe system 
basically handles everything. I, I define my acyclic graph, I can look at that graph, um, they handle all the interfaces to different tools. And the fantastic thing is, um, for example, BET is, is just one brain extraction toolkit out there. There are about eight uh, different ways of doing brain extraction. And of course, they all have different parameter names. So some call the in file, uh, in file, some call it dash dash in, some call it dash dash input, and um, sometimes even tools have the same parameter name, for example, minus F, and it means completely different things in different software packages, which is, again, error prone, very confusing, and yeah, not ideal. So the goal of NiPipe is they handle all that abstraction. And for example, if I want to use a different toolkit here, these parameters all stay the same because they are abstracted. And I just have to exchange, for example, if I don't want to use BET from the FSL toolkit, I can use a different tool, for example, from FreeSurfer. And I just have to exchange this. And the rest of the program stays the same because NiPipe handles all the extraction in the background, uh, the abstraction in the background, which is just uh, fantastic and saves so much time and helps um, producing code that's, that's more reliable. Um, so now we have built an analysis pipeline. And we would like to distribute this pipeline to colleagues or, for example, run it on a different platform. That happens regularly to me that I have to change platforms because uh, the current work session I'm running on it runs out of uh, memory. So this is where in the past we used virtual machines. And today Docker promises to do this very efficiently because it has less overhead um, than a virtual machine. So I thought this is great. Uh, and I started playing with this. And um, we have a great tool which is called, or our community has a great tool which is um, developed uh, which is called NeuroDocker. And it's a project that where I can define toolkits I need and it will build uh, a Docker file that I can then um, build. And a cool thing is they have also made use of ReproZip. So I can define what commands do I need in that container because usually our software is uh, two or three gigabyte containers because there's lots of software in there but often I only need a small fraction of that. So by defining what I actually want to run in there, I can uh, zip that repo, make it quite small and nice, deploy it to an HPC, run my analysis, and um, save sp space and time. One problem with, with Docker is that I can't run it. <laughs> I'm not allowed to run uh, Docker on our HPC systems uh, for obvious reasons, because there are um, security implications. I, I could tinker with the network. I could do weird things with Docker containers. So our HPC guys don't give anyone access uh, to Docker. So I thought that's, that's sad. Um, and then last year, there was a great talk uh, at this Linux conference in Hobart, where um, uh, he basically presented a way of, can we run rootless containers? Because we as a scientist, we don't need all the features that Docker provides us. We only need a simple abstraction. Um, so yeah, that is a cool project and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to see more progress in this direction. Um, in the meantime, what I'm currently using is, because it's, it's a bit more mature and it does what I want, is uh, Singularity. Singularity um, is, it doesn't run Docker containers directly, which is a bit unfortunate. It would be really nice if I could just say, oh, take this Docker container and run it in a rootless mode. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work. So I have to build it either from a recipe file where I can uh, define a new container. Unfortunately, they chose a language which is not compatible with Docker. So I have to rewrite all my Docker files. Um, NeuroDocker, the project I uh, showed on the last slide, takes care of that uh, because I can define, do I want a Docker file as an output or do I want a singularity file as an output? Um, so the community already reacted to that and uh, we have some solutions. Um, a good thing with singularity is we can build from Docker. So we can say, build a new uh, singularity file and use a Docker container as a basis. So this works very often quite well. So I just have to change a few things. Uh, often environment variables don't map the same. And also if a Docker container has things in there that were built or that's, that have root permissions, they don't translate into the singularity container. So there has to be some special care um, that these containers actually translate. But uh, for me, it solves a large part of my problems. And I'm also looking forward to see more uh, in this direction. Um, 
So we saw in an earlier slide that a common data organization principle would help with developing and sharing data processing pipelines. And this is demonstrated in the next project, which is called Beats Apps. Again, uh, you see the same names, Gorgolevsky and Ross Poldrack, uh, who are pushing um, these standardizations for neuroimaging to create more robust um, data analysis. And remember, this is the data structure we have. So if we assume that everyone has this data structure, we can build, and this is what, what Bits Apps tries, we can build neuroimaging tools and workflows in Docker containers, provide them for other people to use, um, and then we can package up all our software we need, and since everyone has the same data structure, we can just run on it and uh, hopefully use the correct files and uh, end up with correct results. Okay. Uh, we now got our analysis steps defined and of course we would like to avoid mistakes and find bugs as soon as possible uh, and not do the selective debugging which I had in the beginning. So this is where an interesting idea was proposed by two researchers recently. They wonder if we can apply the same principles from software development to data analysis and they describe how continuous integration and continuous delivery could help the reproducibility of scientific workflows. So a problem I played with this a little bit. The problem is that continuous integration systems don't have the memory, for example, that I need because an analysis, when I run it, easily can consume hundreds of gigabytes of memory. So these continuous integration systems are not yet made for that, unfortunately. I can use it at a later stage when I just read a text file and output a different text file. That's easy to test because these are small footprint uh, computations. But currently, I cannot really translate my, my full pipeline into such a continuous integration system. I think that would be cool, but we are, we are quite far away from that, unfortunately. So currently what I do to help with this problem is one rule I have is no manual steps. So you will not find that, uh, or I will, I will not use Excel to push values around in Excel sheets because this is error prone and these mistakes are so hard to find and very, very dangerous. There have been some publications where they've shown that Excel caused severe uh, misleading results by just taking the wrong columns. So it's, it's way too, too um, to error prone. Um, of course, version control on my code, version control on my data, very, very important. Um, I wish sometimes these things would be easier, especially revisioning of data and data provenance. Um, also what I learned, probably the hard way, but utilizing established projects. I, in the beginning, thought, oh, there are five projects out there. I can probably do it better. I write my own. I realized, no, I can't. Uh, I will make new mistakes that the others haven't made. Um, and what I now try to do, uh, I, I would use established projects. I try to contribute to existing projects instead of inventing my own and making new mistakes. Um, the same is true for, for testing of code. So. Um, Unfortunately, unit testing is, it hasn't reached the scientific community yet because it is, it is hard. Uh, you have to spend twice as much time, uh, you write twice as much code. The code you actually want to do to do the job and to write the test for it. So this probably doesn't work. Um, but a simple thing, what I, what I try to use is assertions. Um, for example, I, I put up a nice example. Um, I have to enter, for example, the ages of my participants in manually. Um, so a research assistant that I unfortunately didn't have uh, put in a wrong age here. So there's a typo. I just scanned young subject, 32, 31, 23, 24, and then there's a typo in there, which is hard to see and which can happen. And then I compute the mean of that and I end up with a mean age of 35.6. The problem is there is no error and it's a reasonable result. I scanned young subjects. So I could go on and continue with my analysis and I haven't noticed that there's anything wrong. So here's an example where I said, okay, I know that I only scanned older than 18 years and younger than 65. So let me test that. And then when I run this code, I actually fail with an assertion error, which is great because I don't get a wrong result. I actually get an error. And then I realize, oh, there was a typo in there. I can fix it. And now I get a plausible and correct result, which is a more desirable state. Good, we finally got a working pipeline. Uh, we want to publish the pipelines and the result. What options do we have here? Um, so often we have the problem that we want to show 
a, it could be a terabyte sized image. So for example, I build minimum deformation atlases and they have an extremely high resolution which can go down uh, to 100 micrometer isotropic and then uh, in, a, in a 3D volume. So they can get quite large. And if I, if I send a file to a collaborator, which is maybe a clinician, he downloads on his notebook and he tries to open that file, he runs out of memory immediately. Um, if the hard drive or the solid state disk has in his notebook hasn't run out of memory beforehand. Um, so we thought, oh, we thought colleagues of mine uh, from the National Imaging Facility thought about this problem and um, wrote an, a web viewer, which is called Tissue Stack, which renders these files on the server and it does a pre-tiling of that. So it's basically Google Maps for the brain. And uh, whenever you click somewhere in the brain, it just loads the data it actually needs. And we have a special uh, data format for that, which allows that uh, to sequentially read stuff, parts of the file without uh, having to open up a 10 terabyte file. Um, another problem we had is um, I wondered how can I bring these developments I make? So I develop image processing pipelines and we get really cool results that could be used clinically. But as you already say, uh, it's, it combines lots of tools, it runs on Linux. Um, if I hand this to a clinician and I tell them, well, you just need to open your terminal and type these 10 commands and then you will get this nice image, they will say, well, they have real problems in their life. They, they can't handle that. And uh, I, yeah, it, it's tricky. So we thought, okay, how can we make this better, better accessible? And we came together at the last health hack in Brisbane. We got a, a great team of developers together who were all passionate about this problem. And we wrote a tool that's called DICOM to Cloud. Um, for this, we had, our aims was we want a de-identification locally because we can't have patient data on a cloud even if it's totally safely encrypted, which doesn't exist. Um, so we need to absolutely de-identify the subject. We need to strip off the face, which is not a trivial process. Uh, we need to take off name, day of birth, scan date, all these things. So we, we do this locally and in a nice graphical user interface where they can just drag and drop the DICOMS files they get out of the scanner. And uh, we got quite far. So we have a prototype which can anonymize. So we use a local Docker container which runs some Linux tools in there to do the, the face stripping and the anonymization uh, and there are some checks that this is done. And then it uploads these brain images to AWS or Google Cloud. And uh, currently we're still looking um, at help to help us to implement these pipelines on the cloud platform so we can actually run analysis on the cloud. So we we got the images there, but now we need to uh, work on the next step and actually start the processing, which is fairly simple because I have the Docker containers ready. So theoretically, we would just need uh, a way of um, realizing there's a new file in a bucket. We need to run a Docker container. We need to output the results. And our client already has the interface to pull back results from, um, from, these, Google, uh, from, from these cloud providers. So we, we build that all in and uh, we will continue to work on that. Or yeah, we are looking always for input there as well. So another problem is uh, that we often need to share an analysis, as I uh, said in the beginning, with, for example, a collaborator or with, with a person who, who wanted us to, to do some imaging for them. Um, and it would be great if the collaborator can explore the steps we did and maybe even change some input parameters because maybe they're not really happy with the images they got. And this is enabled by a, co by a great project called Binder. So if you have this problem and you work with uh, Jupyter notebook files, you can just point Binder to a GitHub repository where there's a Jupyter file. Binder will take all your data from this GitHub repository, spin up a container, uh, we have everything in there that you defined, and then people can interactively play with this data and uh, change things around and explore uh, the analysis. Finally, there are great platforms out there for, for sharing data, and one of them is Open Neuro, which I would like to highlight. Uh, Open Neuro allows sharing of files in the bits data structure, which I already showed, um, and as an incentive to upload data there and to share data with the world, imaging data, they offer to run free analyses of uh, certain tools on this data, and then after um, a fixed period of time, these images get available uh, 
and released under a Creative Commons license so everyone can play with them and hopefully uh, also save costs in the long term because um, what I didn't say is a simple brain scan of an hour can easily cost multiple hundred dollars. So it is quite expensive to get these images. So my goal is always to get the data out there and get it used more so we can actually learn more about the brain without acquiring uh, more and more data which costs a lot of money. So data sharing um, is crucial and um, I think we need to work on this even more. And the last project I would like to highlight is open, the Open Science Framework. So lots of the things I presented today uh, are loose bits and um, the Open Science Framework tries to get this all under one framework. So it has interfaces to lots of the tools I mentioned today um, and it's an in a simple form, it's a, it's a central Dropbox for science where we can push data, uh, share it on a project basis with our people um, and work together on, on, on bigger data. Um, yes, so we came a long way from raw data. Um, we reconstructed DICOM data, we converted to analysis format, stored it somewhere, we processed it somewhere and we even managed to hopefully share our data in the end in an anonymous form, get it on the cloud, get it on websites, get it out there. Um, so in summary we saw that um, many open source tools exist to support a scientific process which is great. Uh, I couldn't do science without all these great tools available out there. Um, but what we also saw is scientists are not software developers and probably shouldn't be because we are scientists so there's only limited time we can spend on, on learning tools and, and tricks um, but we use and write tools to implement our ideas so we need to think about how, can, how we can get this more robust. Um, so what I often wonder is when I, when I try to teach other people to use these tools is how can we make our tools more accessible to access, uh, more, more accessible to people. So when there are, there, are, there are very few clinicians out there. When I show them a command line terminal, they say, oh, this looks like fun. What do I need to type to do that? They usually say, can you close it quickly? <laughs> it, looks, it looks scary. And that is a problem. It is, it is tricky for people uh, who, who don't work with this on a daily basis. And I think this is where we need more, more work, better documentation, and, and helping people to access these tools. Um, and that's why some clinicians pay a lot of money to get a graphical user interface, which is also a waste of, of money and time because these tools are often not as good as open source software, but they are usable. And that's, I think, what we as an open source community often forget. Um, also, what I sometimes wonder is when I play with data provenance, can't we build a file system that handles that automatically so that I don't have to type multiple commands to track files and things? Uh, I know that Google introduced a data provenance system on their Google Cloud, so there it's on by default, so I'm not sure whether, whether we can do this on other systems or how hard that is. Um, let me know if you have a good way of doing that. Um, what I also very often wonder is why can't we just run our software effortlessly across platforms? Why, why do I have to do so much trouble or go through so much trouble to run it on Linux or Windows and Mac? Um, there should be easier ways. Uh, to not lock out people who don't have these platform platforms. Um, and also what I'm often wondering is how can we make it more desirable to contribute to existing projects instead of reinventing and creating new projects with new problems. Um, so these are just some ideas for, for discussion and yeah, uh, if you want to know more, if you want to discuss, uh, grab me in the break and I'm, we have two minutes time for uh, questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yes, in the back. How do you use shift up as a replacement for singularity? Yes. Yes. The question is have I used shifter? to replace uh, the singularity I'm using to run Docker containers. Um, I, I haven't, I looked at it, but I thought the same problem applies to the shifter because I also need to be an elevated user. I can't just run it in a user space. Is that incorrect? Can I just run it as a normal user on an HPC system? Okay. Okay, that is. I'm not sure that you can install it with your home directory. Yeah, okay. 
That is, that is a great comment. So the comment is uh, the administrator can possibly set up Shifter in a way that I can use it as a normal, not elevated user. That would be great. I will talk to our IT department about this and play with it on my own setup and see if we can do something. That would be great, yes. I would love to have um, an easy integration of Docker into our workflows, yes. Any other question? We have one minute left. How's that, that how's that tool called? NiFi. NiFi. Okay, so the comment is uh, there is a tool out there for data provenance that's called NiFi. I will look at it. Thank you very much. I haven't heard of that. Thank you. Yeah, um, with this we are out of time. So if you want to know more, grab me in the break. I will be out there. Thank you so much for coming and yeah, thank you. And we have a... Oh. Cool, thank you very much.